Good. Good. <laughs> it's the tie. Alex, I can talk to Alex because he's my editor. Alex, you're going to edit this part out. If the, especially if the tie keeps getting crooked. Hey, what you have a paper clip? I know, huh? No, you're good. Like, Tape. You're good. Tape. No one sees it. It's just right there. <laughs> you know what? There's no, there's no perfection in the world. You know, it's all good. Okay. So, welcome. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. You guys are going to get some really good information today about how to specifically influence yourself as well as influence others to help them purchase or buy. Because this is all about NLP five-step buying process, or I like to call it buying process rather than selling process. Because I believe this is that we can never sell anything to anyone. They have to buy from you. And that's what we're going to be teaching you today is how to elicit somebody's buying strategy. How to build a connection, how to build the bridge so that people can like and trust you and thus buy from you. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to just elicit somebody's buying strategy and feed it right back to them in a way that they feel so comfortable, they go, absolutely, I need your services, I need your product. Even the kids, too, it's the same thing what we do. So a lot of what we're going to do, the major themes that we're going to be talking about today is this, simply intention is projection, meaning what you picture and what your intent is, is put out into the world, and people feel that and they respond to that. They respond negatively or positively. One of the things I like to say is, at any given time, at any given time when we're communicating with somebody, we're only doing two things. We're only doing two things. <laughs> we're, either, we're either repelling people or we're compelling people. If you're compelling people, they're jumping on your bus. Right? And rapport creation. This is about some of you, have, we've already done this, so it's going to be kind of an overlay of the information. There's a couple of you here don't know this, and even though, Erica, you may be great at building rapport, as we talked about before, if I could tell you exactly what you're doing and how to do it every single time, it'd be a really simple step-by-step -step process. I could do this, this, and this, and immediately people feel comfortable when they walk in your store. That's a, great, that's a great strategy to have. And also state management or setting really strong anchors. Because I believe, my belief is this, is that when we're working with anyone, I don't care what, whoever it is, in any relationship, in any business or social setting, your ability to control your emotions, your ability to control your emotions is going to set the frame for everything that happens at that point on. Controlling what you want, setting your intentions, and controlling your emotions, which is state management. And then next is language utilization, how to properly format or process the information in your head, how to construct it so it's delivered to somebody with the exact intent that you want, so it's producing the outcome or the result that you desire out of this interaction. And the last thing is to uncover buying strategies, which we'll be going over. The majority of what we're going to be spending time on is intention, rapport, and state management, because I believe that is really the foundation of all success in everything that we do. And talking about intention, I found this great, uh, this great slide about <laughs> intent. I mean, this is all about intention. Setting your intention, it really drives your focus home. If you don't know who that is, Michael Phelps was the, what did he win, nine gold medals? Eight, Eight gold medals in the last Olympics? Stone. Stoned? Stoned? Yeah, stoned. He smoked, <laughs> he smoked a lot of, that's what got him there. <laughs> no stress at all. <laughs> This is the simple five-step selling process. This is not in your books, so if you may want to write this down. First step is establish rapport. Second step is ask the right questions. It's on page 118. It's on page 118. You're right. It's not in the book. It's in the manual. The third is find the requirement, find the value. What is their needs behind this? Next is link the value or the need to your product or service. And the last step is ask for the sale. You'd be surprised at how many professional salespeople never ask for the sale. They just assume that somebody's going to buy from them. And the client walks away, the customer walks away going, wow, it seemed like it would have worked for me, but I was never really asked or perceived a perceived value. So what we want to do is we want to ask for the sale because selling is really about serving. But I haven't said this in the class enough, is it's, it's our ability to serve people. It's our ability to serve people. When we serve people, people are going to feel honored and respected. It's about respecting their map and their model of their world. They're going to feel like we honor them and respect them. They're going to give us back that same respect. It's called reciprocity. 
In every sales transaction, a sale occurs. Either they buy what you're offering, or you buy into their limitations. Either they buy what you're, what you're selling, or you buy into their limitations. In any business, if they sell you, you both lose. If you buy or they buy, you both win. We buy emotionally and then justify it logically. That's why we're going to spend a lot of time on this. We buy emotionally and justify it logically. Because one of the presuppositions I have about selling is we can never buy anything logically. You make decisions through, based through your emotions about how you feel about that specific thing and then later on justify it, oh, I made a great decision. Does that make sense? And anytime you guys have any questions or you want to refute me on that or you don't believe me, please raise your hand. This is what this class is about. I want you to understand that I'm right all the time, so I just want to make sure I get my point across. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's not that they don't understand you. You just haven't made yourself understood. Yes. Yet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. There, write this down. You can or not. Okay. I'll explain it again. We'll be going, there's plenty of slides here. So, one of the things that John Grinder and Richard Bandler discovered that in anything that we do, whether it be riding a bike or becoming an athlete or doing business or in relationships, there's a specific strategy or formula that we have to go through in order to produce any result, any result. First, you've got to know what you want. You've got to know specifically what it is that you want. And second, you've got to do something about it. What are you doing about it? You've got to take some kind of action. Third is awareness. Is it working? Is it working? What you're doing, the action that you're taking, is it working? And the fourth and most importantly is flexibility. Flexibility of behavior. As Einstein said, you may have heard this, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's kind of how we go about things. Especially salespeople. They go about selling, they sell from their model, their map of the world, thinking it works. And it may have worked one or two times, but people, everyone's different. People are different. And so we want to elicit their buying strategy to understand that everyone's got a specific map or internal map of their world. And if we can step into their world and understand how they buy things, all we need to do is just feed it back to them and say, is that going to work for you? If we're uncovering their needs and we have what they want and it's a win-win for both of us, of course they're going to buy because it's something that fits their model, it fits their map. So neuro-linguistic programming is simple this. Simply this, it's the mind-body connection. We can only process information through our five senses, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory, taste and smell. We can only process our world through those five senses. Linguistic is the language or the nonverbal and verbal signals and communication that we give out to ourselves as well as other people. And programs or the strategies or recipes that we run on a daily basis to produce or not to produce in action or inaction to produce the results we want. We'll be talking a little bit about patterns and strategies later on. Rapport. Now this is really important. So some of you have done this and have, uh, we've gone through the class so I'm going to repeat this again. So I want to drive this point home because I think this is probably the basis and I really had a lot of uh, interaction with this, this concept this week is the ability to build rapport is going to be the foundation for everything that you do. Everything that you do. If you do not have rapport with somebody, people's walls are always going to stay up, especially in a sales situation. And um, I've been doing this now, doing this sales strategy class for about six years, and the more and more I do this, the more and more I start focusing more on this part of the course rather than the end part is eliciting some of these buying strategies. Because what happens is this, a lot of people, a lot of salespeople come to me and say, well, all I want to do is elicit some of these buying strategies. I want to know how they buy. Well, that's great information to have, but if you haven't built that bridge, if you haven't communicated your needs and ideas, and they don't feel comfortable around you, that's the last thing they're going to give you. That's the last point they're going to get to. Because they're like, why bother? Why should I bother telling you what I want when I don't even like you? They're not even going to go that far. So the more time I spend on rapport and how to create it specifically, it gets a lot of results from people. Because most salespeople are pretty good at what they do or they wouldn't be doing their job. The fact is most sales are lost because people don't want to buy from them. <laughs> Not that they don't want to buy, they don't want to buy from you. <laughs> and the only reason they're not buying from you is because you haven't created a bridge of communication yet. This is what NLP is really about. People walk around with all our crap in front of us. 
our self-worth, our self-esteem, how we feel about ourselves, the beliefs we have, the negative decisions, the negative beliefs we have. And in order to communicate anything, you've got to be able to build a bridge so that their walls come down before any interaction or any communication starts. Does that make sense? Have I driven that home enough for you guys? Because it really becomes apparent when you start getting out there in the world and you start doing this work, because after next week, this is it. You guys are done. You're on your own. <laughs> no more mothership. <laughs> and so your ability to go out and communicate what it is that you want becomes so prevalent. If the one thing I could give you out of this class is this, the only reason that you get anything out of your life is simply you're able to communicate it and express it to somebody else that has the possibility to give it to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Angel. I'm kind of like just personalizing it. Is that okay? Just yeah. My experience. And, and it's just kind of interesting because I've been in, um, I, I do seminars, we sell, I do seminars as well when we sell. And there's times when I figured that my intention is selling, but and I have groups of people around me, I build rapport. Mm hmm but they just don't have money. Okay. And, and there's times, and, and, it's, and it's sometimes the way, like I've, I looked at myself and I said, well, how do I, and I figured it's, it's the word how I present myself. And there's times I present myself differently and I attract people with the money. Yeah. And, and I still haven't figured out what it is exactly. Okay, so let, let's take that. Has anybody ever run into that experience before? <laughs> okay. Of course. So the question really is not, it has nothing to do with building rapport. Okay. Because you're never even going to find out that information until you build rapport, right? They may go, oh, I, I want to perceive to be somebody that's going to buy now. I want to perceive to them that this person, I have a lot of money. I'm walking into your store. I'm walking into your store. Therefore, the presupposition is I want to buy something, right? Now, if they can't afford it, who loses? You both do. I don't want to sell something to somebody that can't afford it. Because we're going to be talking about this later on. There's, there's a strategy, what we call a, a buying strategy. The buying strategy has four components to it. The motivation strategy part of it. The decision-making strategy part of it. The convincer strategy part of it. And the reassurance strategy. We're going to be talking about all four of those components. The person buying anything, I don't care what it is, whether it's online or whether it's from a person or from a manual or a book, has to run through that strategy. What motivated them to buy it? How did they decide to buy it and when? And what convinced them that it was a good decision? And what reassured them later on? What reassured them later on that it was a good decision to buy? Because if you've you ever bought something, your friends go, that was the stupidest thing you, what, what'd you buy that for? That was dumb. Now all of a sudden, what do you do? You start questioning yourself, right? Oh my God, I didn't know. It happens all the time. What's it called? Buyer's, buyer's remorse. <laughs> California has literally built in that three day clause for that now, which is ridiculous. You think, okay, you made a purchase, honor the commitment, but we're building in a psychological value into that decision making process. Oh, you didn't really understand what you were buying. <laughs> My God, in the real estate business right now, you've got to sign paperwork, 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 just because it just allows the, the, the both parties to say, you know exactly what you're doing. And after all those pieces of paper, you still have the ability to walk away from it. So in, in one way, it's kind of senseless to even have that paperwork. Because if you can buy yourself out of that, it just doesn't even make sense to sign paperwork. So the strategy, motivation, decision, convincer, and reassurance. I've got to get them to a point where we have the rapport first, even before I start asking the questions, whether they're motivated, that has a relevance, it has nothing to do with whether they have money or not. Have you ever gone window shopping? Window shopping is motivated to buy something, doesn't mean you're going to buy it, you have no money. So it's all through rapport, you're going to find out that it's... Absolutely, that's uncovering how they, or what their needs are. Yeah, Eric. Isn't also, like from a sales process, um, the, the finding the people that have the money to buy your product, I mean, that's a marketing strategy as well. You know, I mean, who, how are you creating the message that got the people in the room? Right. You know, if you're saying things like, hey, free this, free that, uh, free dinner, free cookies, free, come on now, well, then you're going to attract the person. Free car with every house purchase. Versus the person who finds value in the message. Right. So my experience has told me that if you've got a room full of people who can't buy whatever it is you're selling, then 
uh, I was looking at your marketing strategy, not, not your report. Strategy. And what we're teaching here is the simple strategy of when they got in the room, they're in the room, or they're, you're in face to face in front of them. Marketing is a whole other, we're not going to be going into that. Because I'm just assuming that they want to buy and they're here for a reason. They walked into the store. We have to, we, we have to. We make the assumption that they want to buy something that they're here in the store. Does it mean that every single person who walks in the store is going to buy something? Not necessarily, no. But every person that you, you get a, a great lead from is going to buy from you? No, not all the time. And what a lot of salespeople do is they get hung up on that. Oh, I must be a bad salesperson. I should be able to close every single person. Let me tell you something. If you're spending and wasting your time on the people that can't close the deal, that's about you, not about them. That's about you. Find out by building the rapport first, even if they're able to. Erica. But you, you can also build a rapport and that person come back. Absol Absolutely. They remember you and your... There is so much time spent in building rapport and building that, literally uncovering the strategy for people to buy, it is said that in a marketing, from a marketing perspective, people won't even buy till after the seventh time. But now it could be the seventh or eighth time could be the time they walk in your store, but how many times have they seen the ad? How many people have they talked to beforehand? How many products have they seen that, that you sell? That, that's included in that seventh time. It's not usually the first time, oh, wow, that's a great story. I'm going to walk in and they buy something. That's a fluke. That's a total fluke. They may have driven by that thing a hundred times. So what happens is a lot of salespeople will spend a lot of effort on, on, on selling somebody that is not qualified to buy rather than spending the time and money on the people that are really important. And that really is, comes down to how are you going to know that? How do you know that? The only way you're going to know that is, one, is build rapport, get them to open their mouth and communicate and express their needs to you and ask the right questions. The process is really simple. It's a natural process. Richard and John, when they developed this, this is, like, this is exactly what people do when people buy. Do you have to have rapport every single time? Well, at some unconscious level, yes. Because no matter, have you ever walked into a store and you knew exactly what you wanted, it was sitting right there and it was the right price? And for some reason, you didn't buy it? Most of the time is because the feelings that you have from being in there or with that person. 80% of all products and services sold are because of the relationship and not because of the product or service. 80%. So if the price is right, it's the right color, it's the right size, it's the right opportunity, there's something that causes people not to act, and usually it's the feeling that they get based upon whether it suits them or not. Yeah? Is that 80% statistic? Can you say that one more time? Yeah, 80% of all products and services sold are because of the relationship created. Now, it doesn't have to be a social relationship. It could be the relationship that you have online. A lot of internet marketers now are doing massive amounts of building rapport with people. And some of these guys that I'm actually talking to and buying some products from are making literally millions of dollars a day. Millions. One, one gentleman is working with Tony Robbins right now, Frank Kern. He made $24 million in one hour. What? One hour. Unbelievable lots of money. Now, tell me that you, have to, you don't have to have rapport with those people buying from you. And usually it's a two-step process because there's a lot of affiliate and referral programs going on there. So if, so, if Frank has a product and, and John Reese is selling it, they, John's got a great, uh, a great list, maybe 500,000 people. He's got rapport with his list, and they're going to buy Frank's stuff because they trust John. So rapport has to be there at some level, consciously and unconsciously, in order for us to buy anything. Think back to the last thing that you bought, the last thing that you purchased. I don't care what it was. It could be something as going to buy a, a Coke or a sandwich or an article of clothing. When you walk in, you immediately get a sense of what's going on, and you start deciding whether or not this is going to be good for you. The same process you used to get here in this room. What kind of rapport did you have with the person to get here in this room? Erica, ask it, really. I'm, I'm really curious as to how do I go beyond, let's say, for instance, building that... I'm the owner of my store, I'm a yep. stylist, so the women of my neighborhood know who I am and they come in for me. Right. Now I've just hired someone who's completely opposite of me in the sense that she doesn't 
she's not a stylist. She's more operational, but she's very personable. Mm -hmm. She's sweet, but she doesn't look the part. Mm -hmm. So I'm struggling with the fact of how do I put her on the floor, as I've seen in the last few days, and actually get her to sell. You know, her, her methods are completely different than mine. Obviously, Does that mean that they don't produce the result, or they do produce the result? Really, I'd say one third of the time she is, the other two are gone. Basically, okay. she's not going for it. And she's like, well, like, you know, it's, it's not her thing. However, women relate to what they see most times, and they'll go, oh, she's sort of like me, and she's not. She's burly, and she's a big girl. Okay. Question number one is, what do you want? What's your outcome? Okay, again, going back to that success formula, what's your outcome? What are you doing about it? And are you aware it's working? So you want this, she's doing this, you're getting this. Now, if you go, well, it's not exactly what I want, which is this, and you keep doing this and keep getting that, because that's what it sounds like is happening. Whether it be one time or three times or ten times or over a year, you're still not getting the result that you want. You got to look at that process of how you're doing it or how you're helping her or not helping her produce that result. Okay, so it's, it starts with you. All right, then my next question would be okay, what is she specifically doing that's not helping you get to your outcome? And what result is she not doing or getting? What strategy is she using that's not helping you get what you want? Now, I would, again, from an employee, an employee employer perspective, I want to tap into what her needs are. You've got to tap into her needs and what her values are, what's most important. We'll be talking about that in a minute, listening to the right questions. What's most important to her to find out what drives her? It's not that she can't do what you want. She's just doing it a different way, right? She has a different recipe for doing it, and it's not working for you. That's fine. As Dr. Phil says, we teach people how to treat us. Okay? We also teach people what to do. So maybe or maybe not, you're teaching her what not to do or to do and getting that result. So I got to look at I got to look at me and going how am I helping her or not helping her do this result? Now if I'm if I have laid out a very specific plan for her, and I'm encouraging her along the way, maybe she's not capable. So we have to look at that too, what her what her part is in that. But it starts with you, right? It trickles down to her. Now you give her suggestions, write her on a list. Here's what I'd like to have. Find out what really drives her motivation, what she, mo mo she most passionate about is really going to drive that process of her doing what it is that you want to do, not her way of doing it. That's the biggest challenge, and you, you've all been employees. You all may have people that work with you. It's the most challenge I have when companies or corporations call me is, my employees are not motivated. Well, great, I can tell you that it's not your employees. It's the process you're using and you choosing the wrong employees. If you have the wrong employees, there's nothing you're going to do to motivate them to get what, what it is that you want out of them. It's impossible. They just don't have it in them for that. Some people are more detail-oriented. Some people are more big picture. Some people are more personal. Some people need you know, close proximity of not dealing with anyone. It's just like their own space. So you've got to figure out and you've got to decipher what it is their needs are and what yours are and whether they work together or not. Because all life is is a strategy. It's a recipe. All we're doing is throwing it in different ingredients and we're not getting what we want. So find out what she wants. Find out what she's most passionate. Why is she there? What's imp the question I'll show you in a minute. What, what's most important to you about blank? Let her fill in the blank. Okay, but for now, rapport is simply just mirror and matching three different components. Physiology or body language. Tonality, how they say it. And also the predicates or the words that we speak, as we were talking about before, visual words, auditory words, or um, kinesthetic words. People like each other. Tony Robbins says people like each other when they tend to be like each other. When they're like each other, they tend to be like each other. So this class, I hope, gives you the ability that when you're communicating with people is notice, notice their head tilt, right? This is what we're doing. That. Head tilt is very important eye patterns, blink rate, breathing, these are deeper things. But their spinal alignment, right? Their gesturing, some people gesture a lot, some people don't gesture at all. Their tonality, where's their volume level at? Where's their volume level at? That's, that's huge for people, especially if they're auditory. Right? And if I'm around auditory people, I can, I, because I'm a very visual person, I tend to speak really quick and really loud. <laughs> and that can be overwhelming for somebody that's very auditory. Or somebody that's very kinesthetic, they're more, they breathe deeper in their diaphragm and they communicate their ideas a little bit slower and 
you just want to reach down their throat and go, just say it! <laughs> John, when you're speaking to groups of people, you have to mix all three. Yeah, I want to mix all three. I'm, I'm very cognizant of the visual words that I choose, the kinesthetic words that I choose, and the, very, um, the, to the, tone, the, to the tonality that I use, how I say the words, not just um, what I'm saying. But I'm going to use uh, auditory predicates as well as you know, fluctuating my tonality and my volume in that. You'll notice me sometimes I'll whisper, sometimes I'll get really excited and I'll stand out and I'll start yelling a little bit more to create a point. Right? So with different people, and when you notice how people communicate, whether they're very subdued, you see their gesturing will come down, they're probably auditory and more kinesthetic, especially if they're talking really slow. Kinesthetic people need to feel the words. They literally need to feel the words before they communicate it to you. So what do you think the time lapse is in those sentences when they need to feel the words or feel the, the context of how they're, uh, they're communicating? It's going to be a lot longer than somebody that's very visual and they've got a thousand pictures running off in their head because a, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm trying to keep up to all these pictures the quicker I talk. So when you notice somebody's cadence or rhythm and you can align yourself with somebody's rhythm in that way, you start building the bridge. You start building the bridge. Right, so communication is the response that we receive. This is one of the presuppositions or assumed beliefs in NLP is that our communication is never our intent. So no matter how much I tell you, it's never my intention until I get it back. Meaning, I'll give you an example, Erica. I love you. That's my intent. My intent could be heartwarming, not for you, but for me, very purposeful and very expressive, and what do I get back? I get a blank stare or like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and that's for what reason? <laughs> so if I'm paying attention to the response, then I adjust my communication and adjust my intention going, okay, yes, yes, I love you. Okay, I got a little bit better response, but still not there. So it's in my perception that do I want to communicate that message or not? Because I can keep going, and finally I'll get to a point where you go, we're on the same page. We're congruent now. But most people won't even go there. They'll go, oh, can't believe that she doesn't love me back. I, look at that response. And blame you. Which is what we do. So communication is a response we get never our intention given. And second, or secondly in this is we cannot not communicate. It's impossible not to communicate. In saying nothing, you're still communicating. So 55% is our body language, our spinal alignment, our head tilt, how we move. What does it mean when your head tilts? I do it all the time. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that you're in rapport with the person. That's just your rapport. I mean, if, if I'm doing this to you, do you get a feeling inside your body when I do this? No. <laughs> well, there's something in, so the, you, she automatically turned. That's so funny. <laughs> I know that mirroring, I've already known that. Right. So I often look at people's body languages as, right. as actual, better than words. Right? Absolutely. And, and a lot, again, a lot of people do that. This, is, this happens naturally. This isn't something that's made up. This is something that we do every single day with people. We're c constantly mirroring, matching people if we're in rapport. And head tilt is a very strong indication. It's very seductive. It's very seductive. So try this, uh, an experiment, because you do this naturally, mismatch somebody. When you've got rapport with somebody, just tilt your head. It, it was slow or fast, either way, and you'll see them either go... <laughs> because internally, they're feeling some feeling that's now it's not congruent. There's something off. And so they're going to try to realign themselves with you if you're in rapport, or you to them. As I did it, you tilted. So it's, again, it's a natural process that we do. So it's, it's fascinating to watch this stuff happen in the real world when you do it. And somebody, what we call pacing and leading, they'll follow you. You'll lead, they'll pace, and all of a sudden, you know, they'll lead and you follow along. It's amazing. Because this is a natural thing that we do. Now, 38% is voice. How we say it, the volume, the tonality, the rhythm, the cadence, the timbre, which is the quality, whether it's really coarse, really high pitch can be the tone. So that means 93%, 93% of our communication is nonverbal. 93% is nonverbal. That's even before we even open our mouth. Our intention 
we talked about in the beginning. Our intent is walking in the room before we even speak a word. For instance, you ever, um, you ever walked in somewhere and somebody will walk in with you or behind you or you look at them and you go, oh, there's something, just something about them, right? It just doesn't sit with you well, doesn't resonate. Or when other people walk in, you go, oh, there's just something, there's instant rapport with people. There's an instant resonant pattern. It's literally a wavelength that we're feeling it. We're, the body is a receptor, a receiver, and somebody's transmitting energy. And we're constantly feeling the environment of all this energy. And when somebody radiates that energy, and it doesn't sit with you well, it doesn't resonate with you well, you're going to get a distinct feeling inside. And we operate from those feelings. We make decisions based upon those feelings that we're in. So when somebody walks in your store, you walk into somebody, and somebody immediately feels, I'm just not getting it with her. Now you've set their emotions off. Their decision-making process is going with their emotions rather than with their logic. I need that. I just don't feel comfortable with her. I'm just not. There's something about it. I'm just. So it's aligning yourself with these people to allow them to feel good about who they are first so that they can buy from you. Because that's really what happens in every transaction. The reason you buy is because it makes you feel good. Gives you a feeling of whatever that is. Satisfaction. The person buying feel good. Well, if I'm buying from her store, I'm feeling good. You know, we, we buy feelings and we don't buy products. We buy feelings. So a simple exercise would be to mirror and match somebody's head tilt, spinal alignment, volume, gesture. Right? Do this with, while I'm up here. While I'm up here, match me. My head tilt, my jet, I mean, you have to be gesturing every time I do this because we're moving around the room. <laughs> like, wow, this is so cool. <laughs> How much control do I have? <laughs> I practice that in the mirror every day. Do you? Yeah, That's so cool. Job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell myself, and I move like this. So you are very to mirror and match somebody. And the simplest things when we teach this class, when we get more in depth, is, is head tilt, volume, and gestures. Those are something that you can notice right away. Head tilt's easy. I don't care what they're doing. They're sitting down, standing up, laying down. You can match head tilt right away. <laughs> Gesturing. Who gestures a lot with their hands? You do. <laughs> Thank you. It's good, good sensory acuity skills. So if you gesture a lot, that's a natural thing for you to do. It's a natural part of your personality. If you come up against somebody, let's say, the Japanese culture, doesn't Jap does not gesture much at all. In fact, in fact, in some of the Japanese cultures, it's rude, it's rude to gesture in ways that will set people off or get in their space, right? Or talk to them. Or at them, actually. Because, in, I mean, the Japanese culture is coming, I should say, coming out of their, sh their shell a little bit more because they're becoming more westernized. But in the last 25 years, up until then, it was, you don't look them straight in the eye. You give them a point of interest and they look down. That's a matter of respect. So looking them in the eye is disrespecting them. Other cultures, in the Greek culture, if you don't look them in the eye, that's disrespectful. Or the Italian, if you don't look them in the eye, or you don't go, go, give them a hug. The French... A kiss on both cheeks, that's disrespectful if you don't do that. So it's being cognizant and aware of how people respond to your interaction and feeding it back to them in a way that makes them feel comfortable. Yes? Yeah, that just explains so much. There's literally a book, if I could, if I could remember the name of it right now, that talks about every culture on the planet and all different gesturing, Different, uh, different tonality, how we speak, what things mean, what things mean. Um, who was saying this? Who, was it one of you in class was saying something like this versus something like this? Uh, Middle Easterns do this. Right. And if you call somebody like this, it means you're a dog. You call animals like this. And so in that... The, uh, I, I, who this was just recently I was speaking to said they were doing this to this specific person and they were insulted and he couldn't figure out why. Because in his culture it meant you're calling an animal. It's like calling an animal. In the way that they did, the culture was calling somebody over, it was like this. 
This is how you call somebody over. Now, something that simple can set off a complete different genre of emotions inside somebody's body. Belching. Belching. I mean, you know, the handshakes in some cultures are rude. You don't do that. I spoke to a guy on the phone that uh, his job was a uh, consultant for the Department of Defense to teach soldiers how to negotiate. Right. Right. Uh, like the leader of the township or wherever they're in, whether right. it's in Afghanistan or Iraq, and you can't sit down with your feet out in front of you. Mm. You have to cross your legs if you're showing the bottom of your soul. That's right. Right. It's in the, of your shoe sole, it's completely disrespectful. And right. They'll, they'll uh, kill you. Right. It's certain, it's in, 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 different, in different handshakes, uh, different hands. The, the way in certain hands that they shake, the left or the right hands is different. So there's a whole... And the order in which they do things as far as... The sequence, the syntax of how we do things. Uh, hospitality, there's negotiating internationally, they talk about yep. how to negotiate with people. There. If you don't understand their culture, you're, you're done. Yeah. You, there's no report that yeah. you'll insult them more than... Exactly. More than and, and again, that, again this, this happens, this has to happen before we even open the mouth. All of this of what we're doing is building the bridge and building communication it has to happen before you even utter a word. So, so in a situation like international, if you're doing business here and you have someone whose international culture coming from... Right. So they what usually build a bridge to you. Two, right? two things, two things could happen, which are what? One is... I adapt to them, right. they adapt to me. Right, and what would be more respectful? I mean the money in the middle, so... No, to that. You, you, yes. Gotcha. You understanding their culture and respecting their language, respecting their gesturing. It doesn't mean you have to stay there. It just means, wow, if I, I mean, uh, Japanese, konnichiwa. Thank you, right? It sets you apart. It just sets you light years above everyone else who may be your competition. Absolutely. Because you've taken the time to mirror them, even though they may have adapted. Absolutely. To it's like, oh. This person took time to understand where I'm coming from. And again, that's the presupposition of NLP, isn't it? Respect to the person's map of their world. Once you do that, you honor and respect somebody's map or their internal world. This person has to honor and respect somebody's map or their internal world. This person has to...